Lord, we acknowledge you are present big time here. It's the only reason why we're staying. Not because we're all that good looking or sexy or something. It's just because, <laughs> well, except maybe you. I don't know. But Father, thank you that you take delight in us. You love our laughter. You love our joy. You lighten our burden. We welcome Helen back in here. Yeah. Just release peace and joy over Jim. And Stephen's now in town. Did David get in? Okay, David and Olivia, and who else is there? Four. Four, yeah. And Logan, and Logan, Logan. Father, thank you now for this time, and we just, as I just submit this to you, Lord, just break open what you want to do, and let me just leave the rest wherever it needs to go. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. Okay, well, welcome everybody to a new month. Hey. Well, well, come on, that was pretty lackluster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, for some of you, new months means, okay, I got new payments, but I need you to think about it in terms of income. How about like, wow, I get paid kind of thing, okay? Okay, you need to think of it in terms of the joy of payday, okay? So, remember, Israel understood this. And every new moon, they came together to hear from the prophet and to honor up first fruits. You take the first and get it blessed, and God blesses the rest. It's just the way it works. And so we're taking this first portion of time. We're talking about things that he set in this month. I believe he does this so that every year we're looking at specific areas of our life going, okay, how am I doing? What needs to shift? What needs to move? And we keep going forward, right? Someone was talking to me recently about somebody who, a uh, pastor, was having a hard time figuring out what he was supposed to release from the Lord. My problem is I get too much coming. And I don't know, out of all of this, God, connected to this new month, what is it you actually want us to, to sit in? Because there's only one part of one passage that we could just camp out in for a week. And it's so much. So that's sometimes my struggle with how I come to you. It's like I've, I've had been at if this huge buffet job, table and I've only Jackson got time to up here something to brief. So when you get the ping, and I give you some scriptures there, right? How many of you got that? I did send it out this week rather than just to myself. I'm getting better at that. Um, you know, that's a place for you to go and to hang out because some of those are, are tied specifically to this month. It's a good place for you to go and bake and be there. So we have new people that are coming on board at different times online. So part of what we do here is connect the dots. And frankly, as the church universal, we're not too bad with when Phil's got a problem with finances, we'll sit down and go, well, let's sit and look about God's promises for your provision and how this is going to work and how are you doing as far as what you're giving unto the Lord. We don't want you to be God robbing, so you got that in order. And how are you managing your house, household? So we can do that. Or, you know, you're not feeling too well. Jacob's kind of sick. Well, it's by his stripes you are healed. And we looked at those scriptures and we've got that. Or you're, you're married. You're going to get married. Okay, great. Well, let's look at those. For a man shall leave his father and mother, woman leave her home. So we do this all the time and we pull scriptures down into our circumstances in our situation and we're getting pretty good on that because it is truth it's living and active but the issue is that gets God, the Word of God into our times and our needs but meanwhile the Word of God gets us to his times and his agenda and he's like okay I, I'm glad to be here for you but meanwhile I'm moving forward on things do you want to come along and so with that we just look at how he ties time into his word so we are now in the fourth biblical month. So we look at places where it says in the fourth month. We look at events that happened during this time and we figure that, well, if God time stamped them, then there may be a reason he wants us to pay attention to it now. Just like we were saying, if Phil had problems with finance, well, I guess there's a reason God put something about money in scripture, lo and behold, okay? Maybe that will help. Same idea with that. And so we're in the fourth month and what God had been showing me recently is that first month, which is Passover, which is the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection, is really like a violent storm over very deep waters, right? And that, that puts tremendous pressure and power and gets released and there's freedom. But then that in a wave formation, how a storm forms a wave, is that power now goes underneath. 
it goes underneath and it's organizing and coming together by these deep underwater channels and you can't always see a whole lot in the second month of transition but then in the third month which is last month we're just crossing out of that now which is Pentecost it crests out and that's when Israel goes to Sinai and they hear the voice of God he releases his word the Ten Commandments there and they just kind of freak out but then years later of course the Holy Spirit comes and falls and it breaks open but now we're coming into the fourth month, which I kind of think is where it crashes against things. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. The um, castle That's door? Right. Pardon me? Yeah. The castle door. Yeah. Yeah. It crashes big time, and it's questioning issues of structure. It's questioning issues old and new, and what we call synchronism when we try to marry old things or other things into what God has said. And it brings that all up to bear. It's not an easy month as far as some of the stuff that gets loosed. Okay? So with that, let me kind of show you the two doors that we look at when we look at the Revelation. Because we not only look at where it says about the month in the fourth month, which is called Tammuz. And by the way, I'll just tell you, and I always tell you this, a lot of times scripture will just have in the fourth month, but sometimes it tells you the name of it. This is scripturally not one of those where it has it named in scripture. It just says the fourth month. Tamaz is actually uh, a word that came out of Babylon, okay, but it has been used by the Jews to identify it. The only place you'll, you'll hear it, see it used is one time in Ezekiel, and it's referring to a foreign god. Okay, I'm just telling you. So I always try to break off between what is tradition and what is biblical. Got it? Always want you going there. What is biblical? You want to be anchored back into the word, into the word, into the word. But then we also align it with the tribe, because when God reordered their time, he also reordered the tribes, and he reestablished their birth order around his presence, the tabernacle. Judah first, Iskar second, Zebulun third, and then it comes now to Reuben. And so Reuben is the fourth tribe. Reuben was firstborn. We'll deal with that for a second, but it's one of the things that we reflect on. What about the tribe of Reuben? So let me just give you some anchor points for what we know biblically. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, <laughs> biblically. Y'all doing okay? Yes. Was worship good? Yes. You know, I'm up here with my eyes closed, so I can't see how y'all are doing. For all I know, you've left. Well, no, I could probably hear the voice. Because I can't, I can't, I love you, but I can't be distracted by that or feel like I'm performing. I need to just be here before God. And which is why I'm not a great musician or a performer, okay? Because those people have to be very aware of how you're, how they're doing. I, I, me, I just know here, right? So, but it felt powerful <laughs> from up here. Okay. And thank you, Sarah and Debbie, for doing communion for us. So we're going to pray over Sarah later. She's getting launched out over to Europe and then on to the next steps. And we're going to pray over Levi because Levi's in a process now of trying to find some direction and clarity. So part of what we're always doing, Gail is returned back now. Hannah is still at, right? People are coming. People are going. Last week you saw Esther and Tara, right? Isn't it cool? You're getting this you're seeing how it's supposed to function. And it's not just that you send and then you never hear from them. They loop back and say, this is what happened. This is how your prayers got connected. So you understand, it's not just that you're sending them, there maintains an energy and a relationship and a sowing, reaping back because of what happened. Everybody here who has prayed and blessed over Gail and everything and prophesied gets a reward back with her for the, the road trip she did for 10 days, right? And it's really, it's supposed to be that way so that we're engaged. Okay. Tara, Tara so, and Esther are going again separately though. Okay, they headed back out again? Esther's in Atlanta with the Light Bears International. That's and right. Tara's at the reservation, the Navajo reservation. Oh, neat. Okay. Right now. Good. Okay. Well, Lord, we bless them right now and they're going, coming and going. Part of what we're able to do to pray over you guys and commission you, you have to understand the significance of that. If you weren't here for when Gail got sent, it was a lot of fun. Good thing it wasn't on video. Oh, well, let me tell you, it was, it was a wild rock'em sock'em time. I mean, but it was necessary because of the significance of that particular trip. Sometimes things are lighter. Doesn't mean it's going to be lighter in the spirit. Okay? Sometimes it's just the way God does it. Sometimes it'll be a whisper. Sometimes it'll come down hard, right? When Gail went, it was one of those hard times. <laughs> okay? Stronger will, so it takes God a little bit more oomph there, right? Okay. Okay, so in the fourth month, these are the biblical events, some of them. It's all around the golden calf process, and I use that word rather than just golden calf because there's a lead up to it that's involved in this month, and there are consequences to it. It's more than just the calf shows up. 
Secondly, one of the big things, is, of course, is idolatry is listed again because an idol is brought formally into the temple after it's been defeated. Then there's a starvation issue that happens with the city. All of these are consequences from behaviors that actually got started way back then in the golden calf. And then there's the first breach of the walls in Jerusalem. And there's a judgment that comes against Zedekiah. There's a second breach of Jerusalem. All of these are biblical account points. And then there's actually the vision and revelation of Ezekiel 1 through 5. All tied in to where it talks about in the fourth month, this. Or where chronologically, because we know when they had Pentecost, and we know that Moses was up there 40 days. And we know that he comes down after 40 days to deal with the golden calf. So biblically, that way, God time stamps the golden calf process in the middle of this month. You good on that? Now, you see a theme through all this stuff kind of rolling. Okay, maybe you don't, but there's a big kind of judgment issue that goes on. And you can look at the Ezekiel passage to understand he gets a phenomenal vision of God, which I, nobody should ever try to paint. <laughs> right? This is the wheel and the four faces and the wheel within the wheel. And you kind of read that going, boy, he was on some really good stuff there. <laughs> he was getting divine impartation revelation and trying to describe it as well he could by the Spirit, right? I mean, there's times when God's just going to like, your brain is not going to be able to fully handle this. So let me just release it to you. We'll go from there. But it comes back to this, which is really about a rebellious people. This is a month with everything that God's done for us, everything that he did to set Israel free, to walk them out through the wilderness, show provision, show he was a healer, speak to them on Mount Sinai when they kick off the honeymoon by sleeping with the enemy. Right? That's a John Eldridge, the author, phrase about Adam and Eve. And it, it happens again and again. And so, this is a quote by Stephen where he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, but it could all be used for any one of these passages, right? Because God talks about, when he, he, when he confronts Moses, is what's going down below. He says, they're stiff-necked people. And here's, this is out of Ezekiel, son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation. So there's a heads up in this time about being stiff-necked or not. There is a realignment that happens out in the tribes of Israel under Levi. Two Levites. The story of two, Aaron and Moses. I'm going to keep rolling on this stuff. I hope you're going to get some. And if I go a little too fast, and forgive me, but I want to keep pressing. The fourth tribe, Reuben, is just a study in, in, in again, this, this issue. Because firstborn, what is firstborn supposed to get? Double, Double portion, right? So excited. And you know, when he's born, Leah says, it's because the Lord has seen my misery. That's why she names him Reuben. Surely my husband will love me now, right? This is huge breakthrough. Remember, Leah is the, the, the not so pretty one, right? The one he didn't want. Oh, great. That, that does a lot for you, right? So to have a child now, Reuben, there's great expectations about what Reuben will bring in. But Reuben falls. Because later on in Genesis, we read this, Reuben went in and slept with Bilah, and Israel heard of it. Bilah is Leah's maid, who she gave to him to be, what, another wife. Okay, some would say concubine, but if you really look at it, it he's given as, as another wife, because he had four all total. But Reuben goes and sleeps with the maid, and because of that, of course, there's hell to pay. But I see in him, a repentance because when Joseph is thrown into the well, right, it's Reuben that works very hard to save him. They originally want to kill him, and they said, no, 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 just put him in the well. And then he goes back to find him, and they find out, he finds out they've sold him off, and he rends his clothes. So you see in Reuben someone who's really shifting back, even in the face of that. And then finally in this, when they're talking with their father that they've got to take Benjamin back to Joseph. Do you remember that whole scene in Egypt, right? In terms of how Joseph's hidden himself. They don't know who he is. He's saying, do you really have a younger brother? Or are you just spies? I won't believe you. So Reuben offers to his father and says, you may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. So Reuben, do you get this? I, I want you to see that in the midst of falling, then Reuben tries to shift back which is why Reuben is not cast out. Israel has how many sons? Twelve sons. That's the second part of that verse in Genesis 35. 
Israel had 12 sons. There's actually a little bit of a gap there. I won't go into, into what the commentators think about that in the scripture. But here's the prophecy then by his father, and this is really ties in with this fourth month, and specifically with Aaron, who, by the way, happens to be a firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Right? Everything's great. You know the rest of it, right? Yeah. And then here, unstable as the waters. You will no longer excel, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. So this theme of the first right, do you get, are you following this about Israel out in the wilderness having been saved from Egypt, having been provided for by God, food and water and everything they need, told that they will be healed of every affliction, they hear the voice of God, and 40 days into the honeymoon, they sleep with the enemy. They're as unstable as water. They go up and defile their father's couch. Do you get how this sinks in? But Reuben isn't kicked to the end of the pact. He has put the fourth. And four is always interesting because the Hebrew letter, Dalet, which is the number four, is a doorway. There's a doorway open and into it. But then it kicks in right here because speaking of a firstborn, that happens to be Aaron, Moses' brother. You do realize he was the older brother to Moses, right? How's that probably grind with you for a while? when the younger brother's really seen as sort of the key one, right? The one that God talks to. And Aaron has a few issues with that. But while Moses is now up there for a long while, right, comes this. Debbie, would you read this out real loudly? When the people saw that Moses was so long coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Okay. How many people were talking to, to Aaron, by the way? 3,000. 3,000 people were talking to Aaron? That's how many got killed afterwards. Well, that's how many, yeah, but that was, but right now, how, how many people were around Aaron? How many were down in the camp? Yeah, I mean, 600,000 men, so they've estimated two to three million. And of that, who do you suppose was talking to him? Was it the riffraff? Was it the... Probably, yeah, the heads of the tribes. I, I want you to understand how things move by committee. Right? The old joke is, you know what a camel is? It's been a horse designed by a committee. Okay? How do most things in churches get created in the United States? By committee. Okay? And often they'll look even a little, little stranger than that. Okay? So you've got to bear in mind that Aaron now, his brother has been gone, and they're not sure if Moses is now a Mr. Toasty or not, right? Because we went and we were talking about Sinai and about the thunder, and they saw the thunder. The, the voice of the Lord split into fire and came down. It's one of the commentators that talked about that. So in the midst of all that, Aaron succumbs and hears while his brother is up there where? In the presence. And so, of course, you know some of the consequences. Who can read this next? Kay, are you good at reading? I will be. Okay, please. <laughs> Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Cyrus. Yikes, yeah. Okay. Now, I want you to understand how this works with most people who are in a pastoral office. They've got a congregation together. Something's happened that people are waiting for something to happen, and somebody comes up with a bright idea. Okay? And it starts to get a little bit off track. You know, there wasn't, okay, not that he should have known better. I just want to, I just want to, Connect the dots, right? Okay, some of you worked in churches know exactly what I'm talking about. But because I want you to watch this response of Aaron. Now, when Aaron saw this, he saw their response. These are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. You know what he does? He tries to backfill a little bit. Because now, so, oh, well, they're going there. So now what we want to do is we want to, he built an altar and made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. 
He's trying to kind of like steer, okay, well, we got off on the cow. Well, let's just sort of bring him back around the back door here. Okay, the problem is now is you have this blending of the old stuff with the new. Okay, old wine, new wine skin, new wine, old wine skin, right? It's, it's a problem, and of course it's going to blow up, but we need to see it in a little different context than just stark idolatry. Idolatry is there, but he is trying to marry it through. Do you see him trying to pull these two things together? Do you understand what a lot of God-fearing pastors are blessedly trying to do? Because they're under a committee or whatever board, who hired who, who can fire who? It's not an apostolic structure. So the committee gets together, and so the person's trying desperately to do the right thing a lot of times, and then has a choice walking or not. Okay, okay keep one going, please. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Okay, rose up to play is the kind phrase. <laughs> that is the, that is the, the PG-13 version of it, okay? What it was is they're like, hey, it's time to party like we used to in Egypt with all the gods. Okay? Which means you start sleeping around, it gets really wild and crazy. Okay? So you can go back and read the story, look into some of the words if you want, but you have to understand this turmoil is going on. But it doesn't just happen instantly. The process of wearing Aaron down takes a number of days, a number of days, a number of days. How long to form that calf? A number of days, a number of days, a number of days. You have to understand this is all going on down there, and there's a celebration, and this is when God interrupts the conversation with Moses. And Moses will go down to meet Joshua, and Joshua will say, I hear the sound of war in the camp. <laughs> go, it ain't war! <laughs> Which is interesting. Joshua is hearing what he should be hearing if there was loud noise. It should be either the shout of victory or the agony of defeat. Instead, it's let's go off and party with other gods. Okay? But I want to just stop here because I want to segue to the fact that while this is all going on, this is going on. Moses is up before the presence of the Lord, and if you go back and you read prior to Exodus 32, you need to do that, and all the details that God is laying out, he is giving him the divine direction and the blueprint for a structure of, of worship for his people. Okay? And in the midst of that, down below is Aaron in this abominable act. And then I need you to see this. Now, this is instructions of God to Moses. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as a priest. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. I need you to see that while Aaron is going off the rails, like a first son like Reuben, God's got a plan that involves him, is providing for him an honor to show glory and beauty there. And then this part is fascinating. You shall put the two stones, there. this is in more detail, but this, the names of six of the tribes are put on one stone and six on the other, and these two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as a memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. He's supposed to be going before the presence of God and burying Israel, and instead he's burying them out in the desert. Right? You get, I just want you to show the contrast of what God has in mind and where Aaron's going, because you need to see the grace of God in the midst of this. There's a good news, hard news thing in this. But then beyond that, too, there's this part. You shall make the breastplate of judgment. That's what this is called, the breastplate of judgment. Not the breastplate of righteousness. Now remember, judgment doesn't mean negative. It means I'm going to weigh in the balance. I'm going to assess. And Aaron is supposed to carry this on. You should wear the breastplate of righteousness. You should put settings of stones in, four rows of stones, just like you see there. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, the engravings of a, like the engravings of a signet. Each one with its own name, they shall be according to the 12 tribes. And then this, so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart. 
when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. I need you to see what is being given to Aaron to bring the entire nation before the God of all creation. I mean, are you getting the honor? And what's he doing down there? I, I, need, you to, I, I need you to understand the drama, the contrast, because I think we see the same thing playing out now. Where are my ambassadors? Where are my representatives for the kingdom? And are they bringing the whole nation to me? Are they representing them and crying out for them? Do you understand? Okay. So there's this contrast of what's going down below with the calf and what's going on up above. The same thing that's happening. And the question I have is, how often are we creating new structures by committee rather than revelation? Well, you know, we got together and talked about it. It seemed like a really good idea to do this. Okay, is God in that? Is there anointing on that? Was that something that was a divine plan? Or is it just something that seemed like a good marketing idea? Right? It's not that we're not supposed to use our brains. But what happened with the calf is when we get out of the presence of God and we get in the pressure cooker of everybody else's opinion. And you know when you've got two or three million people, there's a tremendous amount of gravity, spiritual gravity. Every person brings expectations and history and baggage and, of course, an opinion, right? I mean, the joke among the Jews is wherever there are two Jews, there will be three opinions. Okay? You guys aren't like that, though, right? Okay. And then this, the help and the harm of tangibles. So let me just put it this way. Do you understand that with Moses gone, with this God who they still don't really understand, they've heard the Ten Commandments, they heard his voice, it so freaked them out they had to cover their ears. But he's not like manifested in a very specific way. Okay, there's the pillar of cloud and the fire, but it's like, you know, we are so used to tangible things that we can touch and feel and look at and dance around and everything else. And we need the tangibles. And so, you know what? God gives them a pattern of the tabernacle of tangibles that are going to represent who he is. That's what's happening while Moses is up there. There's all these tangibles. But in the meanwhile, guess what? They go create their own. Do you, are you tracking? And we create our own thing in the midst of waiting for God or not. Right. And oftentimes the challenge is, if you look at Jesus, is that we get, then get so fixated on certain structures or tangibles that when God wants to shift those, we go, oh, no, 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 no. God wouldn't do that. I mean, after all, it was with godly money that we built these pews. Yes. And you know what? They're right. Yes. It was. I, I have no question that there was love and devotion to try to do that. But the challenge is, is that we start to miss the means to the end, and the means becomes an end. Now, what was supposed to let the people of God join together now becomes more and more confined and restricted, and sometimes the only way they know how to encounter God. And now, instead of that being a means to God, it becomes the end in of itself. So Jesus says to them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you would have life. It's often the same way with tangibles. So let me just say, you come into that structure, or you come into this structure, because you think, right, you're going to find eternal life. And all these things, the pews and everything, testify to me, but you're unwilling to come to me. Do you, do you see? Instead, you just come to church. You don't come to Jesus. So the danger always of the tangibles. This is a time where we're aware of, in the absence of other things, we will make our own tangibles or we'll get tangibles and we'll hold on to them. Here's another one. This is from Caiaphas, the high priest, who's talking about everybody going after Jesus. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our and our nation. Wow. We're so attached to the temple that we'll take that over the Messiah. And so what was intended to be a place for the people of God often becomes then a prison cell block. 
because again, it was supposed to be a means to an end which was connect with Jesus, to connect with the Father, connect with the Holy Spirit, but often it becomes a means of itself. Just let's do church. Let's go to church. And it's like, no, 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 meet with me. Every place has this danger. And so it is a month where we have to watch because we have to hold all structures so lightly because everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. To the degree to which it starts to interfere with your direct relationship with God, you've got to back up a bit. Okay? Because God will come and start to smash it up. The temple was destroyed and there's reasons for it. Okay? Jesus had zeal for that house, right? It consumes me. He loved that place. Mm -hmm. But he also knew it had to be pulled down so that the new work could get pulled up. And you know what? God continues to do that. It's why there has to be a divine revelation that comes down to Peter with Cornelius because otherwise the church would have been hung up on how the Holy Spirit was going to come to the Gentiles if he was going to come at all. So God has to... <laughs> Peter gets called on the carpet. What the heck are you doing out there? Well, nothing. God did it. <laughs> like, okay, we're going to have to go with that, right? It's, it's the way God keeps doing it. So in this time, there is a heavenly plan. There is a divine template. So I want to encourage you that while Aaron was down there trying to stitch something together, old and new and put together, Moses was getting a divine download. That's where we got to go. Newsflash, God is continuing to download new plans for new things because he's moving forward because the old ones are getting people stuck. AKA, I can't take credit for the carrier word. It came from somebody else. It was just released over me and my head blew off. But we know, we know. Any of you have a question that that isn't a valid model for what God had? There's, it's a template for understanding how you come and how you go, that things are moving. We're going to have to move with it. We're going to have to be flexible and fast. We're going to have to understand we're in a warfare context. We're going to understand all that we need, and we understand every single week that you are getting relaunched back into your assignment. It isn't about this. It's about who you are out there for kingdom. This becomes a place. This is a means. The end is the connection with God so that the end is out there. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Don't come, therefore, and sit on your butts all year in the temple. Right? It was, this is, it's not the end. It's that I have more. I want to bless the nations through you. So, you got this so far? The question is just this. Will we, make, will we follow the heavenly plan, the divine template, or will we make our own instead? And particularly out of the familiar and the comfortable. We have to be very careful here, folks. We are a new work. We got this new thing that God's given us. We're walking it out. But let me tell you, it can become an idol in a heartbeat. And the moment you stop coming to really worship and seek God and you show up just to consume, we're done. We're done. I love you, but we're done. I, I yeah, that's, that's, that's a consumer model. Can't, I, I know. I love you, but you can consume somewhere else if it's that way, right? Come be loved on, give your love, get equipped, get employed, get deployed so that you can go out and do it. So, other thing with this point, that I'm just bringing you some stuff that comes out of this month. Do you see how that comes out of this month? Do you see how you need to check in, in your structures and where you're going? If we are a royal priesthood, then here, who do we bear upon our shoulders? When you're going before the Lord in prayer, are you aware of that? Are you aware that we are a royal priesthood? Who are you carrying over your heart that you walk into the presence of God? It doesn't mean you've got to pray out loud for them every day, but are you aware that you bring them in, that you are a royal priesthood, that you are meant to intercede? Rather than screw them up down there? Which is where a lot of times we do? Okay. And then it's a month of intercession, and I say that for this reason, because in that conversation, when God's up there with Moses, he talks to them. Who can read this out loud? Loudly. Big voice. Someone. I can do it. Okay. I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Who's saying this? God is saying this. He is like, at it. And I love what he says, now let me alone. Back off, Moses. Does Moses back off? 
No, he doesn't. Okay, keep going. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them for the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. I love that you have to get prayer from from an understanding of Moses and Abraham dealing with the, the angels, the Lord's going to go destroy Sodom. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Will you destroy the whole city for 50? Right? And they have this, there is an intercession that goes on. I just, um, I was spoke on prayer on Monday night in the prison, and I talked about that Peter was in prison, but the ecclesia, assembled ones of God, were interceding for him. And God sends, you know, Peter is so spiritual, he's dead asleep. <laughs> you know, and the angel has to whack him on the side and wake him up. And it's only when he's finally out in the courtyard that he realizes it's not a dream. He wasn't interceding for himself. They were. The intervention of God comes in. So, intervention now of Moses here. Keep going, please. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Okay. I want to connect this to you also because we're in a year of seven, 57, 77, 2017. Number seven, okay, in scripture is connected to covenant. It's a picture of a sword. So. I use it as another flag when I'm going through scriptures. Okay, what do you want to pop out? Well, here is where Moses is laying a hold of the covenant as a means of the promise and saying, Lord, you said, Lord, this is about your covenant purpose. Lord, this is about your glory. There's a pattern here for intercession when we go before the Lord. Right? Lord, this is your kid that we're talking about. I know he's under the blood of the Lamb, okay? He is under your covenant. I'm bringing this to you. You, you do that out loud. You go before the Lord. Okay. So it's a month of confrontation. Everybody say, okay. okay. How many of you like confrontation? Yeah, okay. Generally not. Oh, no, no, let's just keep unity. Okay, but unity becomes uniformity. And it is a month of confrontation. So here is, is Moses coming down. I'm not giving you the whole scenario, but I'm just highlighting this. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? <laughs> I love this, right? In other words, he's trying to give Aaron, boy, they must have tortured you. They must have threatened your family. They must have plucked out your eyebrows and put your arm behind your back and held you over a hot fire, right? They must have threatened to take your salary away, Pastor. <laughs> what, what did they possibly do to you that would allow you to lead them into such a great sin? Do, do you understand the relevance for today, just where it is? Okay. So, and of course, Aaron being forthright and strong and, you know, really courageous. Do not be angry, my Lord. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> you know, I don't really know how this happened, God. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. Do you understand? But you have to, you have to personalize this too. This conversation goes on within us. Well, you know, God, maybe I could just do this. And then we justify it, and then something happens, and we're like, oh, well, look at what happened. I didn't know that was going to be the, okay. okay. This is a month when God says, no, 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 no. Yeah. I wonder if it was a calf, because it was just a lot of bull. Just a lot of bull. Okay, there you go. There you go. There you go. Uh, you know, I even dug into, I was curious because in the Hebrew there it talks about it being earrings. And I kind of was curious about, I always start looking at the, at the roots of things. The first time it's used actually is as a betrothal promise. Abraham's servant is sent out to find a wife.
for Isaac. And when he finds Rebecca, he gives that's the first use of it, first principles. It's it's a pledge of betrothal. And so they've taken off. Now I don't know if these earrings were coming from all the Egyptian gods, and so when you throw it into the fire, that's what you get, right? It's just kind of an interesting thing. All these connections. Yeah. Actually it's not even earring, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nose nose rings too. So if you think it's just back to the future, guys. We're just we're just going back around again. Okay, so but it is a time when Moses has to confront Aaron with that. Moses also confronts before this, he confronts God. No, 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 no. Ah wait a minute. Don't let this come back on you. Moses has been in the presence so long that he is first jealous for the glory of God and secondly the deep compassion for people who just drive him crazy. Hmm. Right? The whole conversation, you've got to go back into it, where God says, your people, and Moses says, no, your people. <laughs> it's like, you know, your son. Oh, wait, why is he my son now? Because, okay. So, I want to show you another thing, because in the chapters 1 through 5 of Ezekiel, when this mandate is given to him after the vision of the Lord's presence on the earth, he says, you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and give what I give you. So God's confronting Ezekiel, warning him not to rebel like the very people he's going to go to. And then he goes and speaks this. Gail, read this out loud, please. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth, and give them warning from me. Whoa. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to the one, the wicked, from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require to him. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. This word comes in this month. Okay? Aaron had the chance to confront the people and say, do not do this. Moses does it. Right? Now, Aaron, God will bless Aaron and keep Aaron, but you know, years later, just to bring up, Aaron loses two sons. They have somehow picked up this over-familiarity with things holy, and they're offering unauthorized fire for the Lord, and the Lord consumes them both. So you have to understand it sets in motion. But the Lord will still establish Aaron as the high priest. He will still stand before the presence of the Lord. But there's a confrontation that has to happen. Real quickly, I'm going to just tell you this. I was in the airport on the way back from Dallas, and I'm waiting for a connecting flight, and this guy had a Red Bull shirt on, but it said blood bomb. And it was just, I, I hadn't seen it, so I'm just kind of looking at this going, okay. So I thought, well, this is kind of a conversation opener. So I go over and we start to talk a little bit. He's from Japan. He's going down to Valdosta for some business and stuff. English isn't real great. So it turns out we're on the same plane. So that's like, okay, this is good. So I says, well, what does this mean? He says, well, I don't know. Huh. I said, I just bought it down in Mexico. And he shows me the back and I said, okay. So we talk a little bit more. And so I figure out, well, I'm gonna see him on the plane. Because right, I mean, I'm just feeling like, okay, I know kind of where I'm going to say, but now I'm thinking through and I'm going, well, I'm going to invite him, see if give him my card. Uh, we get off the plane, invite he and this other business partner to come up to dinner sometime. Sure, Levi would like to meet him from Japan and everything, and we'll just walk through there. I never see him again. There's only one plane that night to Valdosta. I don't know where he went or how I got. But let me tell you, you think I didn't wrestle with that one. Lord, was this the opportunity? Because I, blood bomb, I'm going to go, you know the only blood bomb I know is Jesus. Yeah. Right? I wasn't trying to be trite. I just, it was just a connect. I go, blood bomb? Give me a break. I have a picture of him with the shirt because I wanted to bring it in as an illustration just going, okay. Not about my telling him anything, but just because I thought it was kind of compelling. Sometimes there will be stuff in the culture that just connects a dot for you. I've asked the Lord that we cross paths again here while he's here for three weeks. Okay? Because, but, but this is why Ronnie's story about having a word for that young guy, but it not 
having the occasion, but the guy calling him up. I said, thank God for second chances. Yes. Okay. Okay. You're getting this? I'm not trying to put a heavy on you, but I want to make you aware. You are in the priesthood. You're a royal priest. Okay. That means that stuff that Aaron fell to, you're susceptible to. That means the glory that Aaron could have walked in and did walk in in terms of presence before the Lord, you get to walk in. What do you bear on your shoulders? What do you bear on your heart? How are you standing against the pressure? And the question is this, we become like what we behold. So here's this, who has the lion's share of your FaceTime? Is it Facebook? Is it TV? Is it videos? Is it some family issue? Who's got the, and I use the word lion's share for a real reason, right? The lion's share of your time because we become like what we behold and so Aaron in all that pressure and all that gravity and everything else it just becomes overwhelming he's got two three million people he's got probably 70 elders they're all talking at him the same thing after a while we probably all would collapse Moses meanwhile where is Moses he is before the presence of the Lord so if you are ever someplace and someone starts to bitch about the fact that the pastor is spending two hours or three hours or four hours a day in prayer and can't be reached by phone, you go, amen, and I'm going to protect his office door or her office door. Do you get it? Because the presence is what has to drive. Otherwise, you're in committee all the time. What, are you going to get? what kind of divine pattern are you going to pull down? Well, I'm hoping that they're all connected with God, too. Well, how are they doing? They're all probably running flat out, too. What are they going to get? What are, they, what are their errand on this stuff that they're bringing around? So what's the FaceTime that we have will create the reaction that we have. Moses' FaceTime with God results in a holy fervor about God's reputation and the goodness of, of his people. Aaron just collapses and exposes them. But he certainly got along. Hey, you know that Aaron's a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. I'm glad we hired him. Good pastor. Boy, we really had to work on him for a while, but he came around finally. Good thing, look at that calf, hey. <laughs> About time, let's party, okay? We finally got this thing raised. We finally got this thing built. Boy, glad they finally came. Do you understand? Okay, sorry. So, we become like what we behold. It's just what it is. You know, so I kind of had some fun with this. So, you know, we become like what we behold. It's just the way it works. And you know, how about this one? I think this is pretty good. We become like what we behold over time. You know, you say people start to look like their dogs. It's because they buy dogs that look like their people. And you know what? Couples start to look like each other. There are studies on it. You know what they find? That the couples who start to look more like each other are considered happier. They actually are happier. Okay, how about this one? You know, I mean, <laughs> we become like what we behold. So the question is, what are you beholding? Are you in the fray of this, or is there enough of this? Nature is this phenomenal thing that just communicates to me the glory of God. Yes. Yes. Okay? And then this verse, of course. But we, with all unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, I've, I've got to wrap up here quickly. Are you getting this? You get, okay, I need you to get some traction. You have to know this is, and I am paring down what could have been, just so you know, you're like, oh my goodness, shut up. Okay, no. So I need you to see this because this is a month in the midst of confrontation, there's a realignment, and I need you to be aware of this. Moses and Aaron are both of the tribe of Levi, but this is where the entire tribe comes. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, in other words, following the feast, they were just having at it, to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him, and he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from the entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Obviously, God's not going to call you to be killing someone, but I need you to see that in the year of the sword, do you understand why I pay attention to this passage and made sure it was hit? Why I paid attention to the one that calls on on covenant because it's a year of the sword. The sword will divide. And in a month of confrontation, 
you have to be aware and be willing to confront. I'm sorry, I, what can I tell you? There are people that need to be broken out of structures and they're trapped in them. And they're trapped in them most of the time because nobody will speak up and say the emperor has new clothes, the bars are on the doors, you're not walking in a biblical model, we are not being equipped, we are not being sent out. This is all about professionals and unprofessionals. What's going on? This is not what I see in the first church. Why do we call ourselves that? Okay. Hardening to the heart. This whole question of dealing with the rebellious people comes from a stiffening. This one word, and I'm blanking on his name right now, maybe I'll get it. But what we attend to, we are softened toward. What we ignore, we become hardened to. So Moses was softened to the glory and the word of the Lord because he was attentive to that. He was ignoring all the people down there. So he was hardened to what their issue, right? Not to them as people, their ultimate need, but he was to their opinion. Whereas Aaron was constantly barraged by the opinion of people. And he was softened to that and his heart was hardened to the true things of God. Where is the lion's share of your face time? Whatever you're attending to, you will soften to. Whatever you are ignoring, you will become hardened to. Are you getting worship? Are you getting the word? Are you getting things that are encouraging, uplifting? Are you getting people that are speaking life into you? You may have a lot of people in depression and everything else. You've got to find people who can speak life. Okay. Am I giving you too much? Tale of two brothers of Levi, right? He's the firstborn, but he falls. Now, I will say, the grace will meet him there. He submits to the pressure. He tries to meld the old and the new. He exposes the people rather than protects them. He shifts the blame off, but here's the good news. Regardless, he is still favored. He is still made high priest. He is still honored, right? Do you, do you get all that? For all the screwiness and all the craziness, God still has mercy on him. And then there's Moses here. Before, he stays in the presence. He gets the divine plan. He intercedes for God's reputation. He confronts the leadership. He confronts the people. And he realigns the body. And because the Levites come aside, they are forever given that position inside. Okay, so final question. When push comes to shove, how will you respond? I want you to just, do you get that for this month? Okay, Kim. I think uh, the main thing that comes to mind with this teaching is right before we left Virginia, we were part of a, a spirit-filled Episcopal church. It was just a phenomenal place. And there were three of these churches in Virginia that had decided to vote on whether they would stay Episcopal churches or revert back to the Anglican community because of all of the ordaining of gays and marrying of gays. And the church we were in voted, I don't know how many people were in the congregation, but everybody voted to leave except one person in the congregation, the pastor said. And the pastor stood up and said, you know, we, we talked for months about how we were going to do what God called us to do, even if it meant we lost everything and had to worship in a cornfield. And they lost everything. Every bit of property, every building, three churches, one of them got to retain everything. We were part of one that didn't. I mean, they had property built, a school, they had a church, they had everything, and they lost every bit of it. And those people were out worshiping in a cornfield. We left just at, at, after we voted, we basically moved here. And 10 years later, that church is still standing. Mm -hmm. That's, good. That's wow. what still that going. reminds me of when you're yeah. talking about tangibles yeah. Yeah. tonight. Yeah. 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 That was a perfect example. So I want you to just watch this cycle in time. That big storm explosion, all that energy goes into the deep, it transitions, it crests out, breaking open at Pentecost by the Spirit, by the revelation of the Word, by the voice of God going, but now it crashes against certain structures. And the question is, will we revert to the old structure? Try to marry the old and the new. Will we get the divine thing that God wants to do now? And just so we know, we can be out of, out of sync with what God's doing here tonight if we're not careful, right? We have to constantly be asking, God, is this what you still want? That's part of the challenge. As soon as you buy a building and you put this and you put this and 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 put this in place, now you get a bigger and bigger vested interest and you've created more gravity and God says, I need you to shut that down. You're going, shut what? 
Oh, you mean this building that you gave us the money for? Yeah, I need you to shut that down. Oh, but you would never ask us to do that. You gave us the money for it. You shut it down. We're better at starting things than ending them because we don't know how to do that and that God tries to teach us this by saying, every day I'm going to end it at sundown and give you a new day. Every week I'm going to end it with Shabbat and give you a new one. Every month I'm going to end it and give you a new one so you get used to ending something and starting something. Ending something and starting something. Are we getting clear? And I can do that about every group of people and organization that I want to put together. The carrier model works because we don't own it. The carrier belongs to the greater government, which is the kingdom. I get to be captain for a while until I get reassigned somewhere. You get to be here on the deck until you get reassigned again. <coughs> Nobody owns you except him. Your allegiance is to the king. Where you go, when you go, how long you stay or leave, that's between you and him. We'll help you, you'll help us, that's how it works, and then we go wherever we need to go. Father, I pray that out of all this, they will take the word and you will imprint in them the deep truth. Father, I specifically am crying out for the heart of Aaron because we can all be that way. We can all compromise when we should stand. And Lord, we need to bear on our shoulders and over our hearts the names of the nation and we need to bring them before your presence we need to understand the incredible call you've given us we need to move out of being unstable as water and find our footing father i thank you that for all the ways that aaron <laughs> messed up that you met him with grace you met him with grace and father i pray for the heart of intercession to rise up in us like for Mo like moses did before you for your glory and to call out and connect to covenant and we seal this word that it can't be stolen but it'll bear good good fruit in the name of Jesus amen